Today I'm going to preach upon ways to avoid slipping. Ways to avoid slipping. My text is Job 12, 4 and 5. Let's read it together, please. I am as one mocked of his neighbor, who calleth upon God, and he answereth him. The just upright man is laughed to scorn. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. Please be seated. Dear Lord, we do ask that you help us understand your word today. We thank you that you've given us, given us life, given us mercy, given us a Bible, given us a church, and the freedom to come and worship. May we have thy Holy Spirit today in fullness. That we take the warnings, the admonitions that you've given us soberly. In Jesus' name, amen. By slip today, I refer to your Christian life. To slip in the Bible means to fall into a major sin. Now, it can mean to fall into afflictions without sin. Or it can be a fall into destruction or judgment because of sin. It can also mean to fall into a state of non-repentance, hardened. I don't want to fall into destruction. I don't want to fall into a state of non-repentance, and I certainly don't want to fall into sin. And then there's the final fall at the second coming for believers, the second coming of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, where you are punished in relation to the coming kingdom reign in regard to your reward, not your eternal salvation. So, we might interpret this text as meaning that he that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised. If you refer this slipping to affliction that God has placed somebody in in his providence, like Job, then Job would be the lamp despised. Those that are at ease would be those that are judging him and not listening to his wisdom anymore. The righteous man is like a flashlight. But when the righteous man falls into poverty or sickness or something where his value in the world is not esteemed, then what happens is he is a lamp despised. So what would this be teaching us if we take he that is ready to slip to refer to affliction that doesn't mean falling into sin? What would this teach us? It would teach us that you should not despise the watchmen that the Lord has raised up for you. You should not despise the leaders. You should not despise spiritual mature believers in your life because of your pride or because you have maybe progressed or prospered beyond what God has in his providence allowed them to do. Maybe they could be richer than you had they not taken a different path. Matthew Henry says we are apt to call reproofs reproaches and to think ourselves mocked when we're simply advised and admonished. This is our folly. Job suspected the true cause of their conduct to be that they despised him who was fallen into poverty. It is the way of the world. In other words, not only were they looking at him as you've, you've obviously sinned to have these troubles come upon you, a horrible thing to say, and if you want God to send some troubles your way, you judge somebody harshly and assume they're sinning, uh, Sometimes they are sinning, and that's why they're having troubles. But you better be careful assuming that 
and, pr and presuming it, uh, but simply for the very fact that he has been afflicted and has lost his business, lost his ranch, lost so much, could have caused them who were living in ease to be puffed up. It is the way of the world, says Matthew Henry, and we ought not walk the way of the world. It says in Jeremiah, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. The Bible's predicting a time will come on this earth when you will have believers, professing believers, both of them, not ashamed anymore of abomination. That's how far the culture goes to where like well look at the culture I, I'm a little better than the culture is so I must be doing all right even though you're walking in abomination you might not be a sodomite yet God forbid you might not be a cannibal yet God forbid but does that mean all the other abominations are all right no they're not ashamed they're gonna come a time when there's no conviction whatsoever when if you just went back a couple of decades ago you would have been ashamed to come outside with what you're doing neither could they blush well there's an age even if they blush you wouldn't be able to see it they're wearing a mask therefore they shall fall among them that fall I'm trying to show you how not to slip how not to fall but the Bible says, if you're not convicted, if you cannot hear those that reprove you, if you don't have a conscience anymore, you're going to fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. That's tribulation period. That's national judgment, as well as the judgment seat of Christ at the second coming. He goes on to say, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. That doesn't mean everything that everybody has done in older days was right, but a lot of things they did have right, and you better look in the Bible and see what they did have right. And just because people have changed, that doesn't mean that you're allowed to change. You're going to be judged by the biblical standard, not the cultural standard. So you need to ask for the old path. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your soul. But they said, we will not walk therein. God says, I will set, I also set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. The people had become no longer convicted in their conscience, no longer listening to those that God raised up to admonish them. The Bible said in the last days, they will heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. They say, I don't like what they told me over there in that church. You know what? He told me I had something wrong. He told me that I was doing this wrong. He told me that, 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 that this wasn't right according to the Bible. I'm going to go find me a church where they tell me what I want to hear. And if they can't do what I want them to do, then can you imagine if you tried to be a church that pleased everybody's whim, everybody's sin? The Bible says, obey them. Hebrews, that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. God says, I'll raise up watchmen as they that must give account. In other words, every pastor is going to have to answer to God for what he did or did not teach. And if he says, well, God, and the Bible said, be not many masters, because you will receive the greater condemnation. It's dangerous to be a pastor. God will say, well, why would you listen to the people? Well, they would have left church, God. They would have whined. They would have got upset. I had to tell them what they wanted to hear. God says, well, now you're in trouble with me. You're afraid of being in trouble with the people. Now you're in trouble with me. God says, be obedient. They got to give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Don't put pressure upon a parent to compromise. Don't try to blackmail your parent into compromising. Like a six-year-old, I'll, I'll hold my breath. I'll hold my breath if you don't let me have what I want. What well, gets more serious the older you get?
whether it's a parent, whether it's the leader of a family, whether it's a pastor of a church, we're looking at despising authority. It says in Proverbs 10, the wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. He said, do you hear what they told me over there? Do you hear what this fella told me? Do you hear what my daddy told me? Do you hear what my pastor told me? And they go around, they tell everybody in the neighborhood. But the Bible says that if you cannot have God direct you, and God's going to use means, he's going to use the instruments he set up, he's going to use your pastors, he's going to use your parents, he's going to use those spiritual Christians like Job in your life, and if you, the Bible doesn't mean that they're infallible. That's not what he's saying. But you better make sure you're listening and not that you're full of stubbornness and rebellion because the Bible said you'll fall. And God says, I put watchmen over you. You didn't listen to them. I told them what to do, and I warned them they better go because if they don't blow the trumpet, if the watchman doesn't sound the alarm, I'll take it out of the head of the watchman. The blood will be on his head, says God. He better do what I tell him to do. He better go tell what I say tell. The Bible says they don't listen. That's their fault. They're going to fall. But there's another way we can look at our verse that's also true, Church of God. Happy Lord's Day, by the way. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. Let me show you another way we can look at this that's also true. In the Bible, that is, with the rest of Scripture. He that is ready to slip, let's not take this as somebody like Job falling into affliction and then being despised by those that used to follow him for wisdom. Let's look at this as someone that is ready to slip with his feet into sin and judgment by God for their sin. That is in the backsliding. He that is ready to slip, to paraphrase this, is like a lamp despised. It's like a flashlight despised in the thought of him that is at ease. So the Bible will be presenting you a word picture. Imagine somebody that's going outside at dusk, and you say, don't go out there now. Uh, uh, snakes come out and eat frogs, and they're all over the path and everything. Get you a flashlight. Don't just go out there and feed the dog or do whatever you're doing. Now, what, what, what if somebody says, oh, no, I can see. I'll be fine. I don't need a flashlight. Now it's getting darker, and it's getting darker, and it's getting darker. There's glass. There, there might be things you could trip over. There might be snakes. There might be anything out there. And uh, this fellow says, I'm at ease. I don't have to worry about anything. He's at ease not because he doesn't have to worry about anything. He's at ease because he's foolish. He's at ease because he's prosperous. He's at ease because he's careless. He's sinfully at ease. And he says, I don't need a flashlight. So the person looks at him, shakes their head, and says, he's going to slip. He's going to fall. There's ice outside. There's bad things outside. There's snakes that blend in with the sidewalk. There's all kinds of things. He's about to slip. He's going to fall. He wouldn't carry a flashlight. He that's ready to slip with his feet is like a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. So the warning is this. Beware of prosperity making you uncareful and proud so you despise the light that is in your life. God is the light in our life, and he speaks to us primarily and absolutely in an infallible way through the Holy Scriptures. The Bible says that it, this Bible, is our light. His word is a lamp unto our feet. Then there's people in your life that want to bring that Bible to remembrance to you. Remind you of what's in it. So the teaching is this, Church of God. Beware of scorning. Beware of pride and haughtiness. Beware of hating and mocking reproof and correction. Beware of saying, I don't need the flashlight anymore. Beware of saying, you know what? This book used to have a place in my life. I used to read it every day. I used to read it every night. I used to think about it. But now I've surrounded myself with other influences. 
We used to sit down at the table and have meals together and read this Holy Bible. I used to go to church where there was preaching and the Word of God. But now that I've got rich, now that I'm not in affliction anymore, now that things are going just as I wanted them to go for the most part, now you're careless. I don't need my flashlight anymore. That's for baby Christians. Whatever I say or think is automatically right. Oh, I can feel my way. Oh, oh, the Holy Spirit guides me. Whatever I feel and whatever I think is the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a horrible way to live? Isn't that a puffed up, presumed way to live? You go outside in the darkness in this dark world and it's getting darker by the day. It is getting darker outside like you would not believe. The times are getting perilous and you're going to go without your flashlight. You say, I don't need a godly church that preaches the Bible. I want one of these big churches that have all the rich people going and, and, and have the gay man over there and the transgender over there. I want that type of church. I don't need the Bible anymore. You're like a man going outside without a flashlight when it's dark. Church of God, beware of drifting away from the scriptures in your life. Beware of making decisions. You're ready to slip, man. You're about to make a decision to go away with your family from the Word of God. A young person says, you know what, I'm going to be like that prodigal. I'm starting to be of age, and I think I ought to make my own decisions. Well, make your decision. How about make this decision, that you stay where the Scripture's taught, amen? That you stay close to the Bible, that you stay close to God's people. Go where the Scriptures are taught faithfully. Where's the Bible in your life? The man ready to slip, ready to fall into sin. Ready to fall into God's judgment is the man at ease. Psalm 17 says, listen to this now. Listen to how it all comes together. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Somebody's about to slip. How did the psalmist say that he was kept? Boy, you got the works of man everywhere. Uh, you, you, you're going to be judged for your works. By the word of thy lips, he's talking to God. By the word of God's lips, the Holy Bible, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. That's how you're going to be kept. See, the destroyer says, hey, that's not the path you ought to be on. That's a, that's a bad path. That's a constricted path. I'm going to show you a path of liberty, and it's wonderful. J just come on over here. Well, why don't you put one foot on that path and one foot over here? And you're trying to walk both ways, but they start going further and further and further apart, and you can no longer straddle it anymore. See, you can no longer straddle it. So finally you say, well, i got to get over here to this path. And so now, hey, you were straddling both of them, and now you're over here. Now you're over here with the easy path. But guess what? It's a trick by the devil. It's the path of the destroyer. He says, yeah, come on a little further. Come on a little further. And pretty soon, before you know it, it's darker and darker and darker. And pretty soon, you're up on a cliff somewhere, and you can't move. And you can't go down, and you can't go forward. You feel constricted. You don't know what to do. You said, oh, how did I get up here? How did I get up here in this mess? I'm going to die. People say, why don't you go back home? Why don't you go back to God? Why don't you repent and get back where you were? And you said, I can't do that anymore. There's no hope. How did I do that? I, I, I'm a mess right now. I'm all tangled up. Now listen, he doesn't stop there. The Bible is what keeps you from going down this path and tripping. Hold up my goings in thy path, thy path, not the destroyer's path, that my footsteps slip not. You know what that is? That's a prayer. So I'm going to tell you two ways that will keep you from the path of the destroyer and keep you from slipping. You need to stay in the scriptures and you need to stay in prayer. You need to stay in a church that preaches the scriptures and prays. You need to pray with God's people. You need to pray with your family. You need to pray individually. You need more scripture and more prayer. God, don't let me fall. Don't let my family fall. Don't let any of our church members fall, Lord. Let us stay on the straight and narrow. Let us stay on thy path because we know that safety, that surety. That's where the blessing is. And I'm trying to tell you, folks, through the scriptures, through taking heed and prayer, don't despise the lamp of your feet.
Listen to this. Psalms 94. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. You ever feel strongly tempted? You ever felt like the devil was just sending some type of dogs to, to, to gnaw at your feet? Have you ever felt like the hounds of hell were on you? You ever felt like the devil's angels, the, these, these devils are just surrounding you and, and they're leading you to be bitter and resentful and that world's looking mighty good and, and you're sore tempted. You need to get in prayer. You need to fast. You need to get in the word of God. When I said my foot slippeth God, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Oh, God will rescue you. But you got to pray. You got to cry out and let him know you need him. You know how many believers live without any consideration of the scriptures, hardly? Just day by day, day by day, one day to the next, one day to the next. When's the last time the family has read the Bible together? When's the last time you sat down and had personal devotions where you read the scriptures to see what God has to say to you? When's the last time you made a decision and says, you know what, I've got to think about the scriptures. What would God want me to do according to the scriptures in this situation? you got young people make decisions all the time and don't even for a second say, what does God want me to do? They just gamble. They say, i got my whole life to live. I'll be all right. I'm not going to consider what God has to say about anything. Proverbs 3 says, in all thy ways, that is in everything you do, acknowledge him. That is, God, what do you say about this? And he shall direct thy path. That doesn't mean he's necessarily going to give you some feeling or, or, or some type of vibration on your ear or something. No, God's going to direct your paths. He's going to show you through the light of the word that this is what you should do. He gives a church. He gives parents. He gives a pastors. He gives all of these things in your life to help guide you. But there's one thing, and that is that infallible word of God that is the absolute standard for us all. Acknowledge him. He directs your path so you don't end up falling somewhere, sliding and slipping away. Look at this, Psalms 1. Hey, wake up, listen. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. See, we don't want this man to slip here. Well, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. If you know some carnal person that's messed up their life, if you know somebody that doesn't have fruit in their life, they've messed up their life all over the place morally, and they haven't repented of it, they haven't said, I'm sorry, and tried to make good on that, why are you listening to them for advice? Because you like what they're saying. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the Bible. And in his law does he meditate day and night. When's the last time you meditated on the scriptures? At least twice a day. Really, it just means you ought to keep yourself in the word of God, thinking about it. But you ought to have special times where you're studying and thinking. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Oh, there's temporary setbacks. There's going to be trials and tribulations. But prospering in the Lord, that true biblical success of knowing you're right with God. Man, just follow the Bible. Follow the Bible. You're not going to slip. See, you've got to beware of even beginning to slip is what I'm trying to tell you, folks. So, uh, uh, Hebrews 2 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. That's the Bible. Lest at any time we should let them slip. When you begin to let the Scripture slip, you're going to You're going to slip. For if the word spoken by angels, that's the Old Testament, was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward that was stoning under Moses, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, that's the Lord himself, not just angels, and was confirmed to us by them that heard him. The Bible's saying that you Christians in the New Testament age, don't you dare let what you've been taught slip. Don't you dare get away from the Bible and away from the truth. There's accountability. There's judgment for God's people. God shall judge his people, says Hebrews 10. But what I'm trying to show you right now is when you begin to let the scriptures slip, you are nigh to slipping in your life. You say, I'll never go off and be a backslider. 
Well, you're already backsliding in regard to the word, so you're on your way to backslide. You said, no, I'm not going to backslide. I I'm not going to go to that church anymore because they're teaching the word and all that sober stuff about the Lord coming and all of that. I, I want somewhere where I can just feel free as I look at the abominations in this filthy, adulterous world out here. You know, I don't want to be reminded and exhorted and admonished and reproved. I want a fluffy church with a fluffy message. Man, I'm going to tell you something. You're already slipping. You've already slipped because you can't endure. The Bible said they will not endure sound doctrine, so they've got to get the fluffy doctrine. I'm telling you, you make these decisions that takes you away from the right path, and you're going to slip. Because God had a path for you that you won't slip. You might not like God's path. It might not feel good. It might look scary. But God's path is sure. It is sound. It is laid out for you. You don't slip. Hey, listen to this. Proverbs 4, Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings. That's God talking to you. And this is a righteous dad trying to appeal to his children. And the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. Go on that path, man. I have led thee in the right paths. Not these slippery paths. Not these slippery paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. You say, Dad, that, that, it sure looks straightened already. It looks narrow and difficult already. I like this happy path. I like this lucky charm path. I, I want to go over here, man. No, 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 son. It looks that way. There are some sacrifices you're going to have to make, but listen to me. Your steps will not be straightened. It's the way of liberty. It's the way of peace. It's the way of a good conscience. It's the way of joy. That other path looks good, the broad way, but it's a lie from hell. It's a lie from Satan. It's dangerous and slippery, and you're going to fall. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Praise God. When you're in God's path, when you're on God's path, you can run on it, man. Sometimes you need to run. But you try that over there in the devil's path, man. You, you're just, you're just going to have to walk like this. And it only gets worse and worse. You're going to fall on the devil's path. See, it says in Proverbs 13, the way, there's the way of transgressors is hard. A lot of times it says, well, I'm not walking over here in sin, yet you're going the way of the transgressor. You're, you're heading in his direction, man. And every day you get further and further and further like a slippery slope toward that direction. Why do you want to go that way? It's a hard way. Why do you want to go the way that led to all of the things you've already seen with your own eyes and other people? It says in Jeremiah, God says, because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity. And they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths, to walk in paths in a way not cast up. Let me, let me tell you what this means. P please pay attention. I want you to notice this. People are having religion in their life. They still have religion, but they have a form of godliness. They still have a church they're going to, sometimes, for a little while. But what these people are doing right now is they've got off the right way. And now they are causing others to stumble by their example and by their new teaching that they got. Oh, I used to be just like you walking in the ancient past. I used to be just like you, more traditional, but I got freedom. You need to leave your husband. You need to get away from that church. You need to get away from those standards. And it caused them to walk in a way that's not cast up. You know what that means? That's been cleared for you. Cast up means God has gone through the road and cleared it up for you, so there's nothing you're going to trip over. The devil has lined this thing with landmines, man. Serpents and landmines and cliffs and ice and slippery things. 
So what these people do is they say, oh, I love Jesus, I love God, but you can look at the wine. You can drink alcohol moderately. It's okay. It's free. Let's go get a Bud Light and hang out together. I don't think any of it's good. But I'm going to tell you something. You see the person later, they have a DWI. You see the person later and they say, pray for me. I'm a drunkard. I'm addicted. You say, how'd you get addicted, man? I know how you got addicted. You went the wrong way. And when you went the wrong way, before you know it, you're not following God's word anymore. And you walked away that had landmines in it, man. And you tripped and you fell. That's all I'm trying to tell you. You say, well, I just got tired of being diligent and sober and careful. You, the Bible said, be not weary and well-doing, brother. You want weariness, get out here in the world. You want depression, how about that slothful person? It grieveth him to even bring a spoon to his mouth. Proverbs 15 says, the way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. He's got a plain way to walk. The slothful man looks and says, man, I'd hate to be you. Commandments you've got to follow. Thinking about the coming of the Lord. Boy, I'd hate to be sober like that all the time. I get to have fun and be free. And he takes off running. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And then boom. You say, well, there he was, and there he's not anymore. What happened to him? He said he fell in a pit. The way he was running wasn't a plain way. He either fell in a pit or he fell down the mountainside. I don't know where he went. He was and he is not. Don't follow the devil's delusion. If he tricked Eve in paradise, man, he can trick you. He can trick you. Again, my son, let not them, God's commandments, depart from thy eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Then, remember sound doctrine, sound wisdom. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. You know why? Because it says, look not at the wine. That's God's way. Go not near the strange woman's house. Don't even go near her house. That's God's way. You get over there and you got man's way. Oh, you can look at this. You can look at that. It's okay. You don't got to be careful. You can go over here and mess around. Pretty soon the fellow's all messed up. He's paying child support. He's got somebody pregnant. It's all in a, just a mess, man. He's addicted to drugs. He's addicted to this. You're not safe, man. You didn't walk away that was safe. How holy are you with well, a pastor hollering at you every day? Or every, every week at least. How holy are you with, with people among you that are trying and striving to do good with some good accountability in your life? Can you imagine if you're outside of church? Can you imagine if you're away from people in your life that are striving and trying to do well? Oh, it says in Psalms 18, Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. Thank you, God, I went your way, and I tell you what, you've kept me safe. You've kept me safe. I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. Boy, I'm glad I went God's ways. Not constricted, not hindered. Man, I tell you what, those small compromises begin to box you in. Psalm 31, And has not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. It's as if I'm in a large room. Man, look, I can walk anywhere. How did I get this peace? How did I get this liberty to be able to walk and not trip? You followed God, man. You went on His path. The way that's made plain, the way that's made sure. You go the devil's way, and before you know it, you could barely walk. He says in Psalms 26, My foot standeth in an even place. 
Oh, what a blessing to have stable, evil, even ground. Man, he set me on a rock. You go the devil's way, it's all crooked, man. Getting back to our example, it says in Isaiah 28, but they also have erred through wine, through strong drink, or out of the way. You know, the devil just says, you know what, you can, you can drink a little bit. Somebody calls you up and they say, oh yeah, I used to be a legalist too and not drink alcohol, but I've learned you can have a good time with alcohol as long as you just do it in moderation, you know. Really? I'm going to try that. Yeah, yeah, go try it and call me back up. The next thing you know, you're drunk and they're like, hey, let me show you the way to go now. And now you can't think anymore. Now you're really out of the way. They're swallowed up of wine. It says the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Hey, if you want to avoid slipping, avoid sipping. You don't want to slip, don't sip. You say, I can sip at it. Yeah, you look at it and sip at it. Before you know it, you'll be drunk, man. You'll be a wino in one way or another. Or somebody else you love in your life will be. As you walk in righteousness, according to the Lord's word, according to prayer and humility, you've got to avoid Satan's tricks. Think always what the devil did to Eve in Genesis 3. How he deceived her with a fake liberty, made her think she could be as a god. So the Bible said, Proverbs 4, enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil man. Don't even get near it. Don't even get near it. People said, I haven't done anything really bad yet. I know, but you're going their way, man. You're going their way. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. And pass away. But the path of the justice is the shining light and the shine that shineth more and more into the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Ponder the path of thy feet. Let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. The enemy is going to raise up missionaries. Missionaries of darkness. That's all right, we already got one. They disguise themselves as angels of light. They come to rescue you from being held back. They turn you toward yourself, toward self-pity, toward resentment, toward rebellion. The main game is victimhood, sinful liberty. They give you a false hope, a delusion. Try to make you live carelessly. What I'm trying to tell you is you've got to follow the people in your life that God's given you to, to live right. Most of all, you've got to follow the Bible. You've got to pray. But you must beware of backsliders that are now missionaries of darkness that are going to give you this fake hope to make you live carelessly. See, there's that unbalanced love rooted in pagan psychology, and it's getting worse and worse and worse, and it's tolerating more sin and more sin and more sin. What does it not tolerate? What is going to be next? Here's a headline, parents and teachers warn not to ridicule school kids who identify as animals. 
a, this is over in the UK, but it's coming here. A government-backed safeguarding group says children dressing up in furry costumes need to feel comfortable expressing themselves. I, I mean, soon this is what pastors will be dealing with. Not just purple hair and hooks and all kinds of stuff everywhere and everybody cutting your hair off, uh, 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 getting more and more modest and, and all of these things. Pretty soon we're going to be dealing with somebody showing up as a furry animal. Meowing while I'm trying to preach. And people are going to say, you know what, you can come to our church. We like furries. It'll be okay in our church. Are you a dinosaur? Safer Schools is a respected safeguarding body. Shares tips on its website, including approaching the child's interest with no judgment and showing understanding. This week in Emerge, schools are allowing kids to identify as cats, as horses, and dinosaurs in class. And teachers are doing little to question such behavior. A teacher at Rye College was recorded telling students not to question others identifying as cats. A 13-year-old was branded despicable by the teacher at Wright College for rejecting a classmate's claim she identified as a cat. When I grew up, if you're sitting over there meowing, meowing, you go to detention hall, you get a whipping. And then if somebody's trying to do their work and they're like, quit it, quit meowing, that's ridiculous. They say, I'm a cat. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. Now the teacher comes over and says, what's going on? She thinks she's a cat and she keeps meowing while I'm trying to do my work. Now the teacher gets on to you. You let her think she's a cat if she wants to be a cat. Educator, education reformer Catherine um, Berbalzing, founder of the Makella School in West London, said she knew of a school pupil who identifies as a gay male hologram. Not even identifying as gay, I'm a hologram. What is not, I, I meant, where is going to be the end of this, brother? What will not their fake love tolerate? It's not love. Safer schools has had government funding for the development of its apps. It worked closely with a number of local authorities and trains teachers on safeguarding. It adds the furry community is a complex one. It's made up of many different identities and definitions of what it means to be furry. That's all I need next is the furry people. We already got the cross-dressing, bisexual, everything else in between, the tattooed, everything. And listen, if you've been in that in your life, let God renew you and cleanse you. God's in the cleaning business. I'm talking about churches that say, hey, that's good. We like that. And what about this? This is just yesterday or so. We're here, we're queer, and we're coming for your children. Now they're just telling you plainly. I remember 20 years ago, when we said they're coming for your children, everybody mocked us and laughed and said, don't, don't you say that about them. No, they're after your children, man. What are you doing? Drag queens spark outrage with an inflammatory chant at the New York City Pride Mart. The chant was met with widespread revulsion. We're here, we're queer, we're coming for your children. Colin Rugg of a new site Trending Politics said the chant showed that the right were correct all along about the threat posed by the LGBTQ community. The right said, the mob is coming for your children, these, these LGBTQs. The left said, you're making it all up. That's a conspiracy theory. Now the latest parade, we're here, we're queer, we're coming for your children. How can anybody doubt that when they're going into the libraries to have tra a transgender story hour? They're, they're making it plain what their goal is. They're making little, little books for kids about all this stuff, you know. I'm going to say it again. To avoid slipping, watch out for people who have become dangerous to your spiritual walk. Hebrews 12 says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace. Try to get along together. Try to work things out. Try to think the best of one another. If there's a conflict, go work it out. In love, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. 
just one person going off, getting a bitter spirit, just one person can trouble many. Lest there be any fornicator, that'll trouble somebody. An adulterer, fornicator, or a profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Esau said, I don't care about spiritual things. I just want to live, live my life. Man, just give me something to eat. I don't care about the coming kingdom. I don't care about rewards. I don't care about nothing. Man, I don't want to think about all that God stuff. Let's just, let, let's just live our life, tell jokes, and have a good time. Nothing serious. What the Bible's saying is that certain people in your life that are not spiritual, that don't want to fear God, they can have a bad influence. And many people that are maybe simple-minded, or maybe they're young people, or maybe they're young Christians, they can be led by a fornicator, or an adulteress, or an adulterer, or just a person that doesn't care much about God. They'll start talking over and you'll see them. Maybe, you know, they'll come to church and they might be behind a building or something. And you might have something serious you're talking about and it might be spiritual. But sometimes you get with the wrong person and that person's making you less and less and less spiritual, see. Maybe it's a relative somewhere. Nowadays, everybody has this whole different world called social media. It's a whole different world where they have influence every single minute of the day. What type of influence is that world? What are your kids doing on this Instagram and all this garbage? What, what are they doing? Who are they talking to? What type of people are they? Are they bitter people that are bitter with their parents, bitter with holiness, bitter with standards? Before you know it, you've got a spirit in you that did not come from God. And now you've got a resentful, bitter spirit toward God and toward God's people and toward His standards. You say, I'm just flirting with this stuff a little bit. Well, you're already going the way. You're already going the wrong way. He said, but it looks so good. The Bible says these roots can spring up and you can trip over them. When I was a camp counselor at that YMCA camp back when I was a teenager, 13, you had to come down this mountainside, or just a hill in South Carolina, but everything was pine straw and pine trees, and there was everybody wore flip-flops to go down. And I'm going to tell you what would happen is you don't see the roots. You don't see the pine roots. And it only takes a couple of days before you're running down that hill. Next thing you know, your flip-flop, stupid flip-flop, got, got stuck all inside a pine root, and your toe's half broken. You say, I didn't see the root. And, and, and every single week, there's, there's a counselor limping around. I said, what happened, man? He said, stupid pine root, man. I was coming down too fast, and I tripped over it. I didn't see the root. Hey, what happened to you in your Christian life? One of them roots, man. I didn't see them. One of them roots. He was there, and he was bitter. She had a bitter spirit. Next thing you know, I'm bitter with my husband. Next thing you know, I'm bitter with church. I'm bitter with everything. And I went their way. That's horrible, man. You gotta watch. You gotta look diligently. No, this person's not good for me. No, this person's leading me away that I should not be going. You say, but they need Jesus. I need to try to help them. Hey, the Lord sent them out two by two, right? Go get somebody as stronger, maybe stronger than you. Go get somebody spiritual and, and uh, go help somebody if you can. But you gotta guard yourself. God forbid you become a stumbling block next. Romans 14, judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or occasion to fall in his brother's way. You say, I, you know, my church friends are great, but I sure love my worldly friends online. I sure like this other crowd of mine. Next thing you know, you're stumbling your sisters or brothers in church, man. The devil will make you a missionary. 
2 Peter 2 says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Somebody's in church, she's a young sister, she's doing great, she's following standards, happy for the Lord, happy to be female, happy to love Jesus, happy to be on fire for God, happy to pray and sing and do things. And next thing you know, while they promise them liberty, they tell them, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that. And they start going this other way. And before you know it, they're bitter. Hey, not only are you bitter, you're about to be a missionary, young lady. The devil's about to make you a missionary too. To destroy marriages. To manufacture prodigals. To call people away from the path of holiness and godliness. I'm going to tell you, it says in Proverbs, they sleep not, except they have done mischief. <clears throat> Their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. Got to cause you to fall. Peter says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Hear what it said. Beware lest ye also being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. You used to be steadfast. You used to be careful. Now you're not anymore. Who you been around? Who did that to you? Not only should you beware of carnal people, beware of carnal isolation. Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit. Please ask these four, it says, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him. <clears throat> Somebody gets out of church. Next thing you know, they're not around Christians that can hold them accountable. Next thing you know, they're not around sober people. Next thing you know, they're not around people that can reprove them. Now they don't have anybody to help them up. They don't have anybody to say, brother, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's a blessing when you got somebody next to you that can say, what are you doing, man? The Bible says in Hebrews 10, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's church, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. So much the more as you see the day approaching. We're sure seeing the day approaching, man. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth that remains no more sacrifice for sins. That's talking about of your high priest. That's talking about in the Christian life. What that means is you're going to be punished. Not eternally, but you're going to be punished. God will judge his people, he goes on to say. The Bible is telling you that church is not going to be some automatic thing to keep you from sin, but it's going to help you. It's going to help you stay away from sin if it's a good church. If it's a church that's exhorting, there's no perfect church. But it ought to be trying. Hey, if you don't want to slip, stay away from the edge, okay? Let's stay in the Word. Let's stay in prayer. Let's stay in carefulness. Let's stay listening and humble. Let's stay in humility and godly fear. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Don't get in this state of mind where you say, I don't need Jesus. I don't need admonition. I don't need church. That's for baby Christians. The Bible says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That is, if you fall, you probably got proud right before it. You got haughty. I don't got to listen to anybody. That's for the baby Christians. Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. You're always to say, you know what? I could be deluded. I want to check myself. I want to examine myself in the scriptures and in prayer and with my brethren because I can be deluded. I can delude myself. But the prating fool says, I ain't got to worry about that. I don't got to do that. I know what I'm doing. He that is perverse in his way shall fall at once. 
telling you, remember the Bible. Stay close to it. Stay in prayer. Stay in church. Stay humble in the fear of God. Stay careful. And you won't slip. One more. Stay in love. The Bible says in 1 John, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. He's got the flashlight. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Can I try to explain this to you? Somebody's walking, and you're like, oh, no, they're tripping. Why are they tripping all over? They just bumped into a tree. What's wrong with so-and-so, man? He just bumped into a tree. He, he's not like that. I saw him the other day in a pit. Listen to me, young people. If you get sinfully jealous or envious or just plain mean, so-and-so said something to me and I didn't like it, and now you go on a vengeful streak, I don't know, maybe somebody's got a better job. Maybe somebody's got a better car. Maybe somebody's got a better wife. I, I don't know what it is. But when you get jealous or envious, the Bible said in the last days, you're headed for the way of Cain. They will go in the way of Cain. And Cain was jealous of his brother. And God came to Cain and said, Cain, sin lieth at the door. Cain didn't listen. He continued with his jealousy. You know the next thing? He was so blind, he murdered his brother. He murdered his brother. You can watch somebody that was normally reasonable and wise, who now they got poked, so they're going to go poke back. Instead of walking in love, and so they start looking for something, and this person starts looking for something, and before you know it, everybody's bumping into one another and biting one another. Let's remember love. Let's remember love. Let's remember humility. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely. Stuff can mess your head up, man. It, it happened to the psalmist in Psalm 73, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He said, I was so close to backsliding, you would not believe. What was wrong with you, psalmist? I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He, he wasn't envious at somebody in church. He was looking out there on Instagram or social media or his neighbor or somebody at work. And he says, look at them, boy. They got that nice boat. They got this. They got that. Look at them. They look like they have fun because every time they post on social media, they're telling you about their trip or this or that or what they did. They're making it look real fun. Wow, I want that glorious life. Oh, Wow. Their hair is puke green today. Oh, I want that hair today. Oh, I want to be like this. I want to be like that person. Oh, she's got a mohawk now. I want a mohawk. She just got her nose tattooed. I want my nose tattooed. You start despising your own Christian life. For some reason, they look like they're prosperous. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So you know what he started doing? He started whining. Well, if the devil shows up, you're no longer loving. You're going to be turned towards self. So he started saying this. I've cleansed my heart in vain. I've washed my hands in innocency. I've done all these standards all the day long. I've been plagued and chastened every morning. You know, I've got to do what God says. I've got to do this while everybody gets to go have fun but me. Everybody gets to enjoy the world, but no, they make me go to this church. Boy, my daddy heard a sermon. Now he's done come home and he got convicted. One more thing I can't do.
Praise God. He got caught right before he fell. He said, if I say I will speak thus, meaning this way, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Love stopped this man. Love stopped this man. This is a baby elephant. It just tripped. I tell you what. Baby Christians can slip and trip real easy. Young people, children. You say, yeah, I'm going to go on over here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back to my old ways. Well, what's that going to do to the young people of this church, man? One of you older boys decide you're going to slip or go the worldly way just for a little while, make a deal with God, say, hey, God, I'll come back later. What's it going to do to your brother, to your sister, to the young one? Praise God, the psalmist said, I don't want any little one tripping because of me. My relatives are watching. My neighbors are watching. People are watching me. My sisters are watching. My physical brothers and sisters. My spiritual brothers and sisters. I'm not going to cause anybody to trip. I'm not going to encourage somebody in their sin. I'm not going to go the way of the backsliders and encourage them and make them strong in their sin. God says, my people would have repented had you not strengthened them. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Oh, God, what will these children do if I fall? God, I'm mad at you. I think I'll just go my way and do the things I used to do. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casteth them down into destruction. He says, you know what? I got reminded when I went to church. I got reminded that what a man sows, he shall surely reap. They look like they're having a good time, but unless they seek God, unless they store up treasure for God, they're going to be in a lot of trouble very, very soon. Praise God, this man decided to go to church. Praise God, this man opened the scriptures and began to pray and went to church and got around the people of God and then he heard a convicting message about you ought not stumble the children and he left church that day and he said, you know what? I was this close to walking away but I remembered the children. What about you, prodigal? Are you this close to being a prodigal? The devil got you thinking about yourself, pitying yourself. Genesis 45, so he sent his brethren away. That's Joseph sending the rest of his brethren, and they departed. And he said unto them, see that you fall not out. By the way, I don't want you slipping and sliding somewhere. We got a job to do. We got work to do. We're trying to rebuild the foundations of the fear of God and the family and God's truth and the preservation of the scriptures. We're trying to rebuild and restore and keep the faith that was once delivered. We're trying to hold on and endure. We can't have people falling out. Don't slip. Don't slide. Stay on God's path. Avoid bitterness and that root of bitterness. Walk in love and peace. Stay humble. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for this church. We thank you, God, for the love that you've demonstrated toward us. We thank you for the patience that you demonstrated before us, before your disciples, Lord, who were many times foolish, many times stubborn, many times bickering with one another, Lord, many times envying one another, many times competing with one another, Lord, many times falsely rebuking and, and, and getting on to others, Lord, that they should not have been getting on to, Lord. They thought they were doing your will. Father, help us. Help us to walk softly, walk carefully. Stay in your book. God, somehow, if you can exhort these young people, these wives, these husbands, these singles, if somehow, God, 
you could show them the danger. Let it be real to them. How sugar-coated the devil will make the Broadway. How sugar-coated and sweet it looks. And how horrible it looks when you see the end thereof. Help them not be deluded by the advertising. In Jesus' holy name, amen.